Hey guys, Spirit of the Law here. I just did a video on my 10 favorite Age of Empires 2 maps based on the real world, and in my continuing mission to explore strange new maps, in this video we'll look at some of the other good ones I didn't mention, but I still think are worth showcasing. I'm not strictly ranking these ones from best to worst, but like last time I am looking out for maps that have a reasonable amount of building space, aren't too low on resources, and ideally is set in a location that has some relevant civilizations to pick from, if a themed sort of game is something you're into. We'll start things off with India. Right off the bat, it has some nice qualities, like a ton of area to build with a few rivers and choke points thrown in there to make things more interesting. It's a giant sized map, so you'll want 6 or 8 players for it, and it has some nice access to fishing for the most part. Ultimately, the only things I don't love about it are the lack of resources to fight over in the middle, it's basically just a few clumps of trees between players, as well as the fact that one player has to start tucked in the far right corner, disconnected from the action. In reality, India has a wide ranging climate, from deserts to rainforests, which really isn't captured here. Plus, the Himalayan mountains are also completely missing. Overall, the map just feels a bit less accurate and detailed than some others, but if you like a big open land water hybrid map, I'd still say it's worth a try. The next one we'll look at is Amazon. This is another map that has some good access to fishing, but what's unique is this one adds a ton of rivers throughout it. I think they did a better job capturing interesting geographical features in this one, with a few open deserts, mixing in some dense rainforest, and then the Andes mountain range that's difficult but possible to navigate through. I think of this as the Inca's home map, and using the coast does connect both sides with a very narrow passage, giving it some strategic importance. The most unique feature though is that the rivers don't have easy crossing points, like shallows. Depending on how much you like the idea of transport landings and sneaky villager drop-offs, that might either be a selling point or an annoyance. An interesting fact is a major fertilizer for the Amazon rainforest is dust from the Sahara Desert carried by wind across the ocean. That doesn't have anything to do with the map in Age of Empires, but I still find that fact pretty cool. Now let's move on to Byzantium. Obviously there's a lot of history here between the Byzantines and a few other civilizations in the game, especially the Turks. At first, it might look like a 4 vs 4 starting on each half of the map, and it does generate that way some of the time, but just as often I've seen it give 3 vs 1s on each mainland. Fortunately, picking Byzantines doesn't impact your starting location, which I think takes away a bit of the fun. And I remember as a kid re-rolling the map over and over until I got Byzantines at Byzantium against the AI. A lot of the fighting on the map ends up being over the water though, with a ton of extra gold and stone dispersed among the various islands. Like all real maps from the original Age of Conquerors, it's a large size, and combined with a generous amount of water, that can make space a bit tight in 4 vs 4 games. I still think it's a good one if you want an archipelago style map, but maybe with 4 to 6 players. The next one is Sea of Japan. A few people thought I would pick this in my top 10, and there are at least 2, arguably 3, relevant civilizations to choose from, depending on if you include the ill-fated Mongol invasion of Japan. Like Byzantium, I prefer if they put the 4 players on the mainland and Japan as separate teams, but in this case it ends up giving a 3 vs 1 on each half of the map. The amount of elevation change on the mainland also makes it tricky to build on, and again space is pretty tight for all players. While I'd say it's okay as a water map, it just doesn't feel balanced quite right to me. If you could guarantee starting positions with accurate civilizations, like Japanese always on the island or Koreans on the mainland, then I think it would sell it for me a lot more. Getting away from the old Age of Conquerors maps, let's take a look at Caucasus. This is one I strongly considered for the top 10 list. The reference is of course to the mountain range extending between the Black and Caspian Seas, dividing Europe and Asia, and is in fact the root of the pseudoscientific label Caucasian to refer to people of European or North African descent. Right away, the map has a lot of ingredients that I think go into a well-balanced game. You have a bit of water, but not too much, lots of open space with resources to fight over, and this one also adds a lot of hills to the mix, with the greater Caucasus Mountains in the north, which are difficult to pass thanks to a lot of pine forests, and the lesser Caucasus Mountains in the south. A handful of cavalry archer civilizations would be right at home on this map historically, like the Huns, Mongols, Cumans, or Tatars. The only major downside of the map for me is just that the trees sometimes generate exceptionally far away from certain players. If you're unlucky, that can definitely mess up your Dark Age, especially if the game isn't set on Explored. The next map we'll look at is a little odd, but I still like it, and it's Bohemia. It has a unique feel thanks to being the only real world map besides Earth with a nomadic start. It's a giant sized map, but as you can see it's surrounded by cliffs and a large chunk of the map is taken up by the void, which I think makes for a really cool aesthetic. You also have rivers with very few crossings, making those choke points important to control. 
The map has one special landmark near the middle with a bridge, possibly Charles Bridge in Prague, and there's sort of an eerie feeling overall with some of the ruins and eye candy, as well as the dirt and marshy patches, topped off of course by being surrounded by the void. It's a cool map overall though, and I think the best at creating a unique atmosphere, especially if you turn on fog in the options to get the full effect. Moving on, we have Indonesia, a hybrid of land, water, shallows that you can build on and that both land and water units can use, as well as some crossable but not buildable terrain. Obviously, fish is big on this one, given how hard it is to get a farming economy working with such inconsistent space. I like that Malay are geographically appropriate here, and also probably one of the best picks, given how much work you'll get out of their infinite fish traps in the long run. That can't be said for every map in their historically connected civilizations, so it's cool when that happens. The fact that both land and water units can interact on this one makes for a lot of chances for demo ships, as well as for making use of the spear unit's bonus damage against ships. The Philippines map is comparable in some ways with these shallows and mixed terrain, though I don't like it quite as much. Because while you have a lot of similar features, you have one player that's completely across the map in Northeast Malaysia. In rare instances, I think having an isolated player can give them an interesting role, but in this case, I think it just gives one player a lot of extra space and an unfair advantage for that person's team. And just to end on a cautionary note, I thought I'd wrap up the real world map discussion with a couple of my not so favorites. These are three maps that I can't see myself ever playing because I don't like the design from a gameplay perspective. The first is Madagascar. The issue is just that with two teams and a distribution of three and five players on both sides of the water, how do you possibly get balanced teams? In practice, what happens is you get three as a team on the mainland and then one lone player trying to hold their own against four enemies on Madagascar itself. That's a tough position for the person trying to hold their own against four. Long term though, the mainland has way more wood at their disposal, and it seems either like a quick win for the island players if they can turn it into a 4 vs 3 fast enough and then make a landing, or an incredibly frustrating loss as the team on the island runs out of wood first. It's a similar situation for Strait of Malacca. Instead of an equal number of players on each side, you have a 3 and 5 situation again, with a much more valuable mainland and a lower resource island. To be generous, some people might like that kind of asymmetry, and for them, maybe it's an okay map, but with so many well-balanced maps to choose from, I can't see ever recommending this one. And finally, I have to say my least favorite map is Antarctica. In one way, it's fitting as an almost empty wasteland, so they got that part right. There's a few clumps of trees and starting resources around each player, and that's about it. Of course, it also has my favorite feature, but not really, with a single player completely on their own, introducing some asymmetry to starting locations. The icing on the cake is they sprinkle in some ibex herds. Hold up, they have a penguin unit in the editor. This is literally the one time to bring it out, and it's nowhere to be seen. If you're gonna make a map like this, at least embrace the fact that no one's gonna play it and have everyone start with a penguin instead of a scout or something like that to make it unique. If you're really feeling a snow map, I think Norse Lands is a much better choice with more generous resources and interesting geography. But those are my thoughts on just about every real world map now between this video and the last. Hopefully you're inspired to try a few out as I think a lot of them are underplayed. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.